Take it all back, hate the things that you said Cause I wish you didn't mean it Under attack, running far, far away And I'd rather keep my distance from you You don't gotta Got a lot of me to get through Push you pull me off into the deep And it lets me breathe that nothing ever happened on that Till I get up, time is barely on our side. I don't wanna waste what's left. The storms we chase are leading us, and love is all we'll ever trust. Yeah, no, I don't wanna waste what's left. And on and on we'll go through the wastelands, through the highways. To my shadow, to the sun rays And on and on we'll go Through the wastelands, through the highways And on and on we'll go That means the show. The Saint Dominic is really making waves now, and we are starting to knock at the door of this NCAA and UAA team in the very near future. We'll go through the wastelands, through the highways, to my shadow, through the sun rays, and
Life gives you plenty of choices. So you have to choose the best. At St. Dominic, we give our students the best education they can get and equip them to reach their full potential and fulfill their dreams in their chosen field of expertise. Our education is beyond basic. In preschool, grade school, and junior high school, we instill the necessary foundation of a balanced EQ and IQ quality of education. We set the bar higher and make sure Dominicans excel in every aspect to prepare them well in their life. Parents envision their children to reach their full potential and someday become role models and ideal citizens of our country and even of Asia. This vision has become our mission since St. Dominic was first founded in 2003 and to this day, St. Dominic has mastered the quality of education that we offer from basic education to graduate studies. St. Dominic continuously hones all passionate achievers to become the professionals they dream to become. Because your vision is our mission.
story of St. Dominic College of Asia is a shining example of what a dedicated family is capable of achieving through perseverance, hard work, and cooperation. In 2003, 12 years after the realization of the Dream Hospital, St. Dominic Medical Center in Tokyo, St. Dominic College of Arts and Sciences was founded, initially offering programs in caregiving and Bachelor of Science in Nursing in collaboration with SAMC. St. Dominic has evolved into a full-fledged collegiate institution with four schools, School of Health Science Professions, School of Arts, Sciences and Education, School of International Hospitality and Tourism Management, and School of Business and Computer Studies. In 2007, the college embarked on an ambitious long-term goal which aims to achieve a university status within the next 20 years. Preparations towards accreditation of the academic programs was pursued in earnest. Rebranding strategies were also explored to make the college more relevant, responsive, and congruent with the current trends and practices of a highly globalized educational system. In 2009, St. Dominic College of Arts and Sciences was officially renamed as St. Dominic College of Asia. The change of name was made to allow the college to grow and provide more room for expansion of its programs and services in the years to come. This change redounds to the benefit of the students as it will eventually give them positional advantage in a crowded workplace in the competitive world for its name reflects the global standards the college stands for. Highlights of this academic transformation includes the launch of the Basic Education Unit. And Level 1 Accreditation of Business Administration, Information Technology, Education, Psychology, Hospitality Management, and Nursing Programs for the Philippine Association of Colleges and Universities Commission and Accreditation in 2014. SDCA continues to strive in achieving excellent service and program offerings. The International Organization for Standardization was awarded to SDCA as a highlight of the 11th founding anniversary. In response with the 2015 ASEAN integration, and backed up by our impressive track record in higher education, SDCA reaffirmed our leadership by keeping up with the changes in the Philippine education system. The launch of our progressive and industry-responsive senior high school in 2016. Same year, SDCA Graduate School offered Master in Business Administration and Master of Arts in Psychology, proved to the community indeed walked the talk. Through the leadership of Dr. Nilda W. Balsikas, SDCA is working towards the Institutional Sustainability Accreditation and achieved the Pakukowa Level 3 Accreditation in the occasion of SDCA's 15th year in 2018. Another milestone marks the crystal year of the institution as SDCA opened the 11-story Greg Dom Building 3. With the dynamism of SDCA's industry seasoned faculty and administrators, the institution was able to achieve various recognition in academics. In the areas of linkages, SDCA continues to have strong relationships with industry partners and academic networks. SDCA's vision to become autonomous status is a mission in the years to come alongside with the efforts to be recognized as center of development. St. Dominic College of Asia continues to accomplish for the past 15 years is a testimony of its core values of service, dynamism, competence, and accountability. Because in St. Dominic College of Asia, we revolutionized education.
everyone. So welcome to today's Dominic Connect. Today's Dominic Connect is all about research. We have three exciting speakers lined up for you that will talk to us about ethics, statistics, and the triad of research. So to start with, it's my pleasure to introduce these amazing speakers. We have our first speaker. She is a graduate of BS Bachelor of Science in Biology from the College of Holy Spirit and also has a degree in Master of has a degree in Masters of Arts in Science and Education with specialization in biology and a doctorate degree in science education from the Philippine Normal University. Currently, she is a full-time associate professor at St. Dominic College of Asia. So let us all welcome Dr. Belinda Abdon Luanag. Good morning, Ms. Kim. Thank you for the very nice introduction. Okay. So, uh, to start with, okay, I will be have uh, talking with you the research ethics and about plagiarism. Okay, so next slide. Okay, so revisiting basic principles of research ethics. So, this is the title of my webinar. And then, okay, to continue. Okay, so the overview of my topic are what is basic ethical principles of research? Why is ethics in research important? And what are the three basic ethical principles of research? Okay, next. The objectives uh, of our webinar today Yes, to define what we mean by ethics in research. Second, to know why adopting an ethical approach to research is important to school, individuals, and organizations who are undertaking research. Third, uh, to apply an ethical framework to your own research design and practice. Okay, so what is basic ethical principles of research? Research ethics refers to the application of values, moral rules, and professional codes of conduct to collection, okay, analysis, reporting, and publication of information about your research, about your research subjects in particular. Okay. It is an active acceptance of participants' right to privacy, confidentiality, and informed consent. Meaning, it is the moral principles that guiding the researchers to the conduct of her or his research. Okay. So, every, every part of the research is important. As yes, we have defined a while ago no, that... Uh, bonding of research experts in collaboration okay uh, cooperation accountability fairness and mutual respect so all of these uh, is Im are important when uh, we have communications with other research experts okay so especially collaboration of schools is very important okay so moving on okay we go now to the three basic principles of research. Okay, so these are the three basic principles. Okay, respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. Okay, so for respect for persons, okay, respect for persons, okay, it is, uh, it incorporates at least two ethical convictions. Okay, first, individuals should be treated as autonomous agents. And persons with diminished autonomy are entitled to protection. So, respect is uh, considered as a universal, uh, 
is a universal uh, way no to 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 relate to other people they apply everywhere in the world so these principles do not have uh, meaning to say they do not have national cultural legal or economic boundaries so meaning to say it applies to all persons so every person has to be respected in science no every living organism has the right to be respected so meaning to say every human uh, uh, person specifically in your study have to understand and uh, know that they are very they are being respected okay next uh, each individual is unique and free okay and and also autonomous and unique and free uh, they have the they have the right and capacity to decide for themselves okay they have value and dignity and they have the right to inform consent okay so we need to say individuals should be empowered to make free decisions or in our research if we are approaching a person or a even it is uh, a a he he would be a good uh, participant in our research of course we have to uh, respect uh, the decision no if uh, he doesn't uh, like to be interviewed for example yeah. so we don't need to ask another uh, another uh, what do you call this a request that he is going to participate in our research okay. it also means uh, that we recognize that each person has the capacity no in this way it has the capacity to make his own decision and then ensures that the dignity of each of your uh, participants or subjects are being valued so important sila sa iyo no okay as a researchers Okay, next to continue. Uh, informed consent. Okay, so this is very important if we're talking of respect to our uh, subjects or participants. It has three elements. Okay, so information, comprehension, and voluntariness. Okay, so the informed consent process promotes respect for persons best achieved by being open and transparent. Researchers must receive an informed consent. This is in the form of it is of a letter okay, from participants. Uh, in most cases, okay, uh, this, uh, this received informed consent is coming from uh, the researcher, so the letter. So they have to be uh, received back okay, by the researcher. So the researcher should provide the information, the following information. What is the aim of aims of your research or the objective of your research? So uh, again, what are the methods that you're going to use? Okay. Who will be undertaking it? And then who is being asked to participate? next is what kind of information is being sought so this is very important because some of uh, the participants may withdraw anytime if uh, informations are sensitive for them okay and then how much of the participants time is required so this is also important all of this uh, i believe has to be uh, placed or written in the informed consent okay next Next slide, please. Okay. So, next is uh, under respect, uh, comprehension and voluntariness is also important. Although comprehension is already uh, in the uh, informed consent or letter, okay, it is still. Uh, important in, in voluntariness. So participation in the study is voluntary, meaning the responses to all questions is also voluntary. Okay? It explains uh, to your participants the following, who will have access to the data after collection. Okay, So the participants have the right to know. 
is it only you as a researcher or your group? So how many are you in the research team? So another is how anonymity of respondents will be preserved. So how are you going to keep the data that you have collected from your participants? So they have the right to know. So and then who should it be returned to and by when? So can you know iba balik? No, so who will be who will be returning and when will the data be returned to the participants? If all of these are being asked by your participants, okay, you have to uh, let them uh, understand, okay, uh, the process of your research, and then also this these three uh, questions is also written in the methods, okay, in your methodology, methodology in the research. Okay, so next, respecting privacy, of course, okay, it is a basic part to respect privacy of all, any, any individual in the world, okay, that's why we have to give them the import, informed consent, okay, and then they have the right to withdraw, as I have said a while ago, and another, so the data, Okay, it might be in electronic form or in manual forms, must be kept securely. Okay, that's why when I was collecting my data because I was in a qualitative uh, paper, okay, each of the re respondents have their own folders. So I have folders for each of my respondents so that I know I can keep uh, their uh, profile or the the um, uh, what part or what date are we meeting so all of those okay next okay vulnerable participants so who are these vulnerable participants back to take are considered as vulnerable because one they are minors so if we say minors these are participants or individuals that are below 18 years old so meaning to say uh, these are children you no know? and if you really need children as uh, your uh, participants it has to be had another consent from parents okay so the parents also have the right to say no or they can guide the child another is pregnant women okay we know that pregnant women, uh, their condition is very sensitive also. So, another are prisoners. So, critical also, no, the cases. If you if you have to un interview them because of their cases, okay. The, all of these, if they want to participate, okay, it has to be uh, anonymity. So, anonymous sila lahat. And then, persons with mental disabilities, of course. Mm? So... If you they if you they they need you know, somebody to guide them during your uh, collection of data, oh also with limited formal education, so with this they also need guidance and then the limited access to health service. This one, okay, uh, some of the participants may uh, don't want or some those who really want to to. Participate in your research, those who are limited access to health data, they they might be, uh, what they call this, uh, feeling or thinking that uh, it is already a, a, a uh, what they call this, um, and a time, no, when they can already access to health services, when they cannot, uh, they cannot, they they cannot afford to. Okay. So, those are the, uh, because uh, if that is the reason of the participants, uh, uh, the, the results may be affected. Okay. Next. If you, okay, to continue. Okay. So, I just want to add before I, I feel, uh, before I end with the, uh, vulnerable there are other vulnerable uh aside from those that are there are also uh the lgbt community the sex workers the drug users of course 
Ayan. And then, women in some settings, like for example, the battered women, okay, in the society. Yeah. Okay. So, those are very sensitive participants. So, as, as are, they really need a uh, guide and careful no, interview. Okay. Next. Next slide, please. Then, number two is beneficence. So, beneficence is coming from the Latin word meaning to do good for the people involved. And so, who are the people involved? Those, your participants. So, we have here, I put this here because it's so cute. No? We have here two dub. So, a student dub says, what are other words for beneficence? So, we also have here Dr. Dub. So, those are the names that I, put, I placed it there. So, they say, Dr. Dub says bene, benevolence, okay, charity, philanthropy, benefaction, kindness, generosity, charitableness, and goodwill. So, that is other words for beneficence. Okay. Next. Okay, so the term beneficence is often understood in a stronger sense as an obligation. Okay, so as a researcher, okay, we have an obligation to our participants and to the community. And mostly, of course, to the paper that we are writing. No? Okay, it is understood to cover acts of kindness or charity that go beyond a strict obligation. Yeah, because uh, sometimes we have to do that or we really have to do that. No, in the research, no, because uh, you want your research to be successful, of course. And this is also uh, written in the methodology part. No, both have to benefit. No? And uh, who are who needs to benefit for the research? Okay, next slide. Yeah. So these are the general rules for beneficence. It is formulated to serve as a complementary expression of actions to participants and the society. You, okay, to avoid harm and minimize possible risk, produce positive benefits, okay, as I was saying a while ago. So, how are, are we going to do uh, less harm and minimize possible risk with our participants, okay? So, for example, the principle of beneficence should cause a researcher to ask, no, if if uh, your uh, your your subjects is really being uh, harmed or uh, is being really there is really a possible risk that your subject will be exposed. So, as a researcher, no, you can. Uh, you can have another way or you can look for another way not to obtain knowledge but with a lower risk to your participants okay and then uh to avoid harm okay the participants should not uh experience the following and embarrassment no belittlement, okay, mapapaya o mamamaliitin, no, in Tagalog, and then anxiety, stress, no, ayan, ridiculed, and then also, not to subject to negative emotional reactions and mental distress. So, all of this you have to consider if you are uh, collecting data with your uh, participants. Okay, next. Okay. So, the positive, positive benefits, okay, of beneficence should be also written in your paper, okay? And your paper should produce positive benefits, of course, because your paper have to, uh, to add to human knowledge, no? Importante yon, okay? It, it should yield accurate and valid results. And then... You have to provide feedback to the respondents if possible. Also, meaning to say, after after your collection of data, no, 
your responsibility as a researcher is not yet finished. No. So if some researchers want to have feedback or they want to have, uh, they want to read the paper, so you can do so if possible. And then promote greater self-understanding for yourself as a researcher. No, uh, We all know that, that if you're a researcher, we really, uh, this, we really are discovering a lot of, lot of things in our person when doing the research. Okay, next. Justice. Okay, this is the third one. Okay, justice. So the principle of justice ensures a fair distribution of benefits and risk of participation in the study. Okay, so meaning to say all your participants or uh, or uh, subjects are are treated fair by the researcher. Okay, it, uh, how do we treat fairly? Of course, diba? if there are vulnerable groups or persons in your research, you have to give special protection. And then, it, this forbids exposing one group of people to the risk of the research solely for the benefit of another group. Yeah. So, you cannot, uh, I mean to say, don't use another group of your research so that the another group will be benefited. No? Okay. Next, and then justice. Okay, more on justice. Okay, this also is uh, must conduct. You must also conduct equitable recruitment of research participants. So, what do you mean? The selection of your participants should be analyzed so that no one is system systematically selected on the basis of race, no ethnicity, class, or other factors. So this one is it depends upon uh, the type of your research that you're go doing, no? Okay. So if you are uh, doing really an ethnic uh, type of research, of course, most of them would be uh, a group, no? Okay. Homosaius group. Next, okay. Now we go to uh, the summary of our of my webinar search okay is the search is conducted according to three universal principles so respect for persons beneficence and justice so we as researchers must work for the well-being of populations that participate in our studies and then third the principles were developed to provide guidance and ensure that the well-being of each participant is always considered and the last one the researcher must understand that research ethics principles and how to apply them. So, as researchers, we have to understand that ethics in research is very important. Important siya. Okay, that's why in our school, we have an, a group that really conduct research. In other universities, they had an office that they only really check you know, papers and they have forms that you comply with the ethics and norms of research based on the school manual. Okay. So, last slide, please. And these are my sources. And then, next. Thank you for uh, listening to Ethics and Research. Now, okay, so I can continue. No? Uh, with a uh, plagiarism. Shall I continue with plagiarism? So, while waiting for my slide, yeah, so let us continue on how to avoid plagiarism as my topic. Okay. So, overview. What is plagiarism? So, what are the offenses of plagiarism? Violations of academic research code. What are the two types? Okay, next is how to avoid plagiarism. So, proper citations, proper quotations, paraphrase, add value, proofread, plagiarism checker, and reference page. Okay. So, uh, what is plagiarism? The Mer Merriam Webster, the online dictionary 2004, states that. To plagiarize, which is a verb, means to steal, 
or pass off the ideas or words of another to our own, as our own, no? To use another production without crediting the source. So, you are committing literary theft and you present a new or original idea that is derived from existing source. Okay, so that is, those those are the acts of plagiarism. Okay, next. So, plagiarism includes the following offenses. So, what are these? Copying, encoding, paraphrasing, or summarizing from any source without giving proper credit. Another, submitting another's work as your own. Okay, yeah. So, it's not your work. So, of course, you don't have, need have to submit it. And then, purchasing or downloading a paper and turning it into your own as your own work. Okay. And so, in research, maybe we don't have the the guts no, to do that. And Okay. So, did you know that plagiarism comes to the Latin word or language to kidnap yeah so nag kidnap you kidnap a literary work no from other from other authors yeah okay next okay what are the violations of academic research code so most schools and universities have policies on cheating and plagiarism so in our school we have the sdca research manual okay is it bad of course, no? Why? Because it imprints academic ethics and academic norms. So we have, you know, all those ethics and norms. It form of it is a form of theft and a type of fraud. Okay, it reflects incompetence, no cheating oneself and students. Okay, so if you're a professional, if you do this, okay, so uh, it is a negative uh, uh, in your part, no? Because it, uh, it, it is an inconvenience. Okay. Next. Next slide, please. Okay. What are the two types of plagiarism? It is intentional and unintentional. Okay. Intentional plagiarism is submitting pre-written papers or downloaded or purchased from the internet or or copied from a book and uh, just change is change the name of the author as your own no another is cutting and pasting from more than one source to create a paper without quoting or citing the sources so every time you cut or you uh, become or, or you cut or you paste you have to uh do the citations okay and then last is borrowing words or ideas from others without crediting, giving credit to the author. And we always need to give credit. That's why if, it, if you are reading a paper, no, you have to take note. No, Take note agad. Take note the references. And next, this is unintentional plagiarism. So why? Why do you, why do, you do this? No, unintentional. Because... Uh, you feel lazy paraphrasing and quoting what I what you have read that you think is important for your paper and then haphazard citations yeah. so citations have rules no we also have to know that okay the uh, bad we have uh, that will be another topic and then lack of understanding of the research process okay so as a researcher as a student researcher really have to understand how the research process is uh, uh, is going on, okay? And then fourth, disengagement from the research process. And sometimes if you're in a group, so, wala uh, nawawala, no? Or sometimes your momentum is uh, not uh, consistent all throughout. So you stop, okay, in the research and uh, this is more common, okay? If you disengage, of course, uh, especially uh, research is really uh, uh, what they call tedious uh, work. That's why sometimes you need to rest, 
Okay, next. Ways to avoid plagiarism. Okay, number one. Always proper citations. Include quotations of paraphrase, add value, and have a plagiarism checker. So, we will be discussing this. Okay, number one. Okay, next slide, please. All research papers must include citations. So, proper citations ensure that anyone reading your paper can easily find your sources. Okay, that the words and ideas used from your sources are not assumed to be your own. Okay, and then authors and researchers are properly credited to their original work. Consult the manual for appropriate for your research. So, these are the guidelines in your proper citations. Okay, I'll give you examples later. Okay, next. Okay, suggested correct citations format for your discipline. So, it means to say, also, we have the following. No, uh, MLA, Modern Language Association, generally used in the humanities. And then APA, the American Psychological Association, generally used in the social sciences. Okay, in the academe, we use APA. Others also use MLA. And then Chicago, generally used by history students. And then CBE for biology and ACS for American Chemical Society or the chemistry uh, world. Okay. And next, so these are our examples. So article. APA article and then APA websites and then the other one below is MLA also an article and then also website okay next so another example and APA 6 and APA 7 because I think there I think we are some schools are starting to use the APA 7 now we have uh, use APA 6 for for several years. No? When I had my MA it, uh, 6 and then for my PhD 6. So I think now they are using APA. Okay, next. Proper quotations. So how are we going to do proper quotations? To quote is a way to give credit to another author's statement. To quote won't take up a lot of your time and to do it as soon as you note it down. Okay, to quote your references won't accuse you of plagiarism. So, you still have to need to quote your, the references. Okay, next. Okay, there are two ways of quoting, direct and indirect. So, this is an example of direct quotes. And if I may read, I am thrilled to be representing the great state of Texas at the Free Spirit Conference here in Washington, D.C. Susie Spunk. His paper advisor said, I owe it all to my talented students. Okay, so uh, the next one is, I am just glad I didn't have to spend any more time with my advisor than I did, said Jamie Joker, who added that she has enjoyed writing the subway more than she did the conference. Okay, so those are direct quotes. Next. So, these are examples of direct and indirect quotations. So, the, uh, the left side is APA quotations and the uh, right side is MLA quotations. Okay, so for indirect, it says here, some researchers note that children are totally insensitive to their parents' shyness. Jan Simbardo, 1977, page 66. And then for MLA, some researchers note that children are totally insensitive to their parents' shyness. And Simbardo 62. Okay, so you uh, you notice the difference between the two. Okay. And next. Okay, paraphrase. So uh, how are we, how are we paraphrasing if we are writing a paper? So effective paraphrasing is rewriting a source ideas or information into your own words without changing its meaning. Now, so, we have to be very careful when paraphrasing that the meaning might uh, change already. Okay? 
So you have to read it again and again. And then ensure you note exact page numbers in the reference. Okay, always, no? Always take notes. And then be careful uh, when paraphrasing. Okay, paraphrasing, if done incorrectly, can slip to plagiarism. So uh, we have to be very careful. So that's why it is said there, uh, you have to, st other others are still uh, placing it in a reference. Okay, next. Okay. Paraphrasing, begin with summary with the statement giving credit. What happened to my slide? Ayan. So, ayan. So, these are examples, no? Begin your summary with a statement giving credit to the source. For example, e.g. according to Jonathan Gozal. So, we do that. No? And then for unique words or phrases that you cannot change or do not want to change, write in quotation marks. And so, you know, quotation marks. They're savage inequalities. Okay, so, you don't want to change those words. So, uh, it ex exists throughout our educational system. So, so still, you have to cite causal, you know, 1992, page 1. Yeah. Okay, next. Thank you. Okay, paraphrase examples for MLA. Some researchers have observed that children seem unaware that their parents are considered bashful. And so, Zimbardo, 62. And for APA, some researchers have observed that children seem oblivious to their parents' bashfulness. And so, those are the two types of paraphrase examples. Okay, you notice, still, you write the name of the uh, author after you paraphrase it. Okay, next. Slide, please. Okay, add value. What do you mean by add value? Okay, as a researcher, of course, you have to present your own idea, no, in the paper. So, insights is adding value to your topic. It shows that you understand what you are talking about. And then you can only do this by researching extensively about your topic. Okay, so uh, I, I, is, I remember no, one of my panel in the title defense told me that in order for you to really understand your paper no, that you will be writing, you have to read at least 100 research. 100 research, okay, in relation to the paper that you are writing. Of course, I didn't, I did not did that the 100 but I, as you go on writing and writing your paper you will discover that you really you will go on no uh, reading reading and reading uh, research papers okay in order for you to really understand your topic so uh hindi mo mapapansin no, that naka ka na ba na, na pala ng almost 100 yan because you have to write it always in your reference, no? So, did you know? So, I have here, did you know? If you're writing on the same topic for multiple assignments, it is it can be tempting to recycle some of your previous words. This is called self-plagiarism. Oh, there is such thing as self-plagiarism pala, no? But if your advisor, or I mean your teacher, no, if this is a term paper, uh, may allow you to do so, okay, so you will not be uh, uh, what do you call this? Uh, committing self plagiarism So anyway, this is my work, but of course, no, you have to uh, ask permission. So I did this, no? I did this to my paper. I asked my advisor. Next. Please, number five, plagiarism checker. Yeah. So, we have a lots of tools in the internet when we need a checker. Now, in our school, we use the Turnitin, no, as our checker. Uh, 
I think the uh, research uh, office, uh, oh, if I can remember, we had a seminar regarding uh, how to have our own turn it in account, no? how to use the turn it in. Okay, and then another one is the grammar Lee. Grammar Lee. Yeah. Grammar and plagiarism checker. Yeah. So these are for free. And there are other a lot of applications you no know, for plagiarism checker so uh, we can inform you no know, our students if you are a teacher of research or any subject we know yeah think the professor knows you no know, if the students just copy paste so we have plagiarism checker uh, next please this is a sample of turnitin authenticity resort result so this is my result no, I did. Uh, I have. We are allowed no twenty five percent or less. So I got twenty four. Thank God. So I had twice. No, I I I ran twice in the turn it in in the school. So that's how difficult no to have a research paper. But of course, eh. As long as we know that we are contributing you know, to the goodness of the school and to the society, we have to do research. Okay, next. Yeah. So, pre predilection checker. Important question to ensure before giving your paper. No, of course. No. So, you are not just going uh, to to just oh i want this i want this checker i want this checker you know in the application in the internet so kasi there are several of them so you have to ask these questions how plagiarism checking tools are earning so are you uh siba are you what do you call this um curious no does the plagiarism checker store and sell your content so those are the things how effective the plagiarism checker you prepare okay does the end report is accurate so these uh, four questions no you have to answer if you really want a pre-plagiarism checker so anyway uh as i remember when i use one plagiarism checker no uh there is an agreement so my agreement yeah okay yeah so here, no, I got this 100, oh, 10 free federation. So, madami sila. Okay, next slide, please. Ayan, proof reading. Ayan. So, proof reading is a big help in checking your paper for plagiarism. You can find the best article, a writer, or expert to prove it your paper. So, in this part, no, we ask the, the a, a good English, uh, teacher and an author not to to group read our paper and then make sure you have cited every source used by checking the reference page so yes i did this no i did this so every page of your paper before you submit no your manuscript you have to check that all of the cited authors there in that page are in your reference page no, if not, no, you forgot it. No, that would be uh, a uh, a big work for you to be going back, going back. So it is really important that you always uh, note, no, note, na importante, okay, yung mga references. And then next page, please. Yeah, and thanks for listening. Okay, so sdca ccap cpag d dedicated to profession c commitment and compassion a accountability thank you for listening uh, to my simple webinar saint dominic college of asia community i hope i have uh, given uh, enough information to our listeners to especially to our students who are undergoing their research paper. Thank you very much. Good day and God bless everybody. God bless you all.
so much, Dr. Liwanag, for that wonderful um, talk. Um, it's very knowledgeable, especially to those who are currently on their thesis writing for four yes, years. Yeah, so we now <laughs> know that um, we are much more aware that plagiarism is a very um, uh, big uh, offense yes. in research. Yes, yes right, so, um, Thank you. So just a few reminders po, um, the link for the evaluation will be posted on our YouTube channel channel on the comment box and please make sure to fill out all the necessary information and use your SDCA Gmail account and after that you will receive a digital certificate for this um said seminars okay so thank you so much uh Dr. Liwanag and we'll see you again later po for the question and answer thank you Miss Kim God bless thank you po okay so our second speaker is um, the program chair of the psychology program and the dean of the School of Arts, Sciences, and Education. He is also a member of the CHED Regional Quality Assessment Team of Psychology for Calabarzon Region. He is also a experienced professor in research and statistics. So um, let's, uh, let us all welcome Dr. Philip Cordova Pison. Hello, good morning, everyone. I'm pretty much sure that um, you're excited with the topics that we have today. And on behalf of um, the uh, research extension linkages and services headed by our Vice President, um, Dr. Balsikas, um, uh, of course, we um, thank you for your time and, of course, your our participation with this webinar, okay? So, I guess let's start. Um, the discussion that I will be giving to, to you today, um, it's very plain, simple, but also with direction. Um, we decided to have this topic, the triad in research development from title to research question to research design because this, this is very essential if you want to start with a good research, okay? Next slide, please. Okay, so what is research title? Uh, research title is it summarizes the main idea or ideas of your study. It's very important that your research title is a clear title. It's because your research title will identify the, the status quo of your whole paper. It will, give, it will give us readers, for example, an idea to what direction that you will be doing in terms of your research, okay? So that's the reason why the title gives a summary to what is really the research all about. And it gives the ideas of your studies as well, okay? And, of course, it describes the contents and or purpose of your research paper. Later, I will be giving you examples of research titles. Okay, next slide, please. So, um, what makes a working research title? Okay, number one, of course, it summarizes the content of the paper in just few words. It is not a requirement for you to have a very long title. It would be best that your title is um, plain, of course, simple, with few words. And at the same time, if I will be the reader of your title, I will have already an idea to what will happen to your study, what will be the variables that you will be using, and of course, what would be the research design that you will be employing in the type of the respondents that you will be using in your research. Next is... Attention of the re reader is being captured. It's really important that the reader will capture his or her attention because that might give also him or her an idea or an opportunity to at least do a research similar to the direction of, the, of your research that you're doing. So that also creates a research opportunity for the readers who might intend to do a similar uh, research based on what research that you have conducted. Okay. Next is... It gives a distinction from other papers of the same subject area. Let's be all realistic that when we are uh, realistic that when we are doing uh, research, we may encounter variables that were already me measured by the previous study, and that um, our title actually gives a research gap. Actually, so regardless if our variables were already measured by previous researchers. But the point here is that what makes our title distinct or different from other researchers? And that, uh, that, um, that's a very good uh, working research title that you can work with, okay? Next. So uh, what are the characteristics of a title, okay? Number one is 
the intention or purpose of the study can be easily identified in your title. So in your title, of course, um, there are variables that you can um, that that are being um, explicitly um, stated in the title, and of course, um, in that title, we as the readers, if we will be if we will be reading your title, we can already see the intention of your study. Whether, for example, if you will be doing an experimentation, whether you just purely describe variables or you want to do some cause and effect or um, correlations with different variables. Okay, so again. Uh, the research title is really important because in, in a very good title, it it should um, already explicitly stated what would be the purpose of uh, or the intention of the study, okay? Next is the readers can identify the variables to be measured. Uh, like, for example, um, a correl cor correlational study between job satisfaction and organizational commitment. Automatically, if I will be the reader, then I will be identifying those two variables like um, satisfaction and organizational commitment the, um, uh, that those variables will be measured in your study. Next. Title can describe your respondents, of course. There are some uh, research, of course, that um, 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 do some qualifications or use a purposive sampling. There are some criteria. Like, for example, if your respondents are students or selected students or among students or, uh, or employees, then as the readers, we can already identify that one of the limitations of your study is the respondent because you already identified that the respondents of your research our students or teachers or should we say employees and the like okay next your research title also describes the research design to be utilized in the study although there are some researches that do not um follow this number four however there are some researchers you are uh, you um put already that the type of research design that they will be using in the in the conduct of their research like for example a correlational study automatically the us readers can already identify oh this is the the type of research that he or she will be using a correlational correlational type of research or others in medical field field they will be using the effects so therefore it's automatic that we are using experimental study we are using the cause and effect um relationship when when we manipulate the independent variable what makes the change in the dependent variable next it also gives us an idea to what possible output can be developed. In a higher form of research, should I say, for example, in master's um, research or um, in uh, doctorate degree research, we, we normally use basis in the development of this and that. So in the title, it also gives us an idea to what would be the possible output um, can be derived or can be developed out of your research. Whether you will be proposing a program, you will be... Um, should we say develop a policies or um, should we say a processes for a particular organization? But therefore, the title can already gives us an idea to what will be happening in your study, what would be the variables that, that will be measured, that the research design that you will deploy, and at the same time, what would be the expected or possible outputs that, that can be utilized by the beneficiaries of your research. Okay, next, please. Okay, so here are the examples of the title. First, for descriptive title, an assessment of anxiety level of college students basis in the development of mental health program. So automatically, the researcher just want to describe the anxiety of the college student. And from that description, he or she intends to develop a mental health program. Okay. Another type of title, which is a correlational, a correlational study between job satisfaction and organizational commitment among employees basis in the development of employee wellness program. So as you can see, the researcher intends to correlate job satisfaction and organizational commitment, whether if satisfaction increases, would commitment, or commitment also increases and vice versa. Okay? For experimental title, the effects of reading strategies in memory and compre comprehension, basis in the development of, uh, of learning modules for students. So the researcher's intention here is that he wants to find out what would be the research strategies would be best in terms of increasing memory and comprehension. And with that, 
what module can be developed in order to increase, of course, the memory and comprehension of the students. So as you can see, that uh, they have different approaches, actually. One is, the first one is purely describe, uh, describing the anxiety. The other one, which is a correlational, you want to take into account the possible relationship, relationship of one variable to the other variable. Then the last one, is or what you want to check the cause and effect relationship whether if you will employ this what would happen to the scores of memory and comprehension okay next slide please so um what is a research question okay a research question or typically known as the statement of the problem in research that we are doing is a set of questions that the researchers seek to find answers okay so these research questions actually guides us to what data we really want to really want to get and what data can be analyzed and from the analysis of this data at what possible discussion can we can we do and at possible discussion that we can uh, that we can do what would be the uh, proposed um, intervention that we can develop okay so this research question is really important in our research and it also and it also guides the researcher as i have mentioned earlier to to what empirical data he or she will collect and the manner on how to collect them okay later i'll be giving you um examples of research questions okay next slide please so this this will be the types of research question course a descriptive type of question such as demographic profile so when we say descriptive type of question we normally employ um percentage frequency distribution we just want to know how many males and females in in your study um how many respondents falls in this each bracket we may represent it in frequency distribution or percentage next um please Questions that assess the variables measured in the study. Like, for example, if you want to assess the level of anxiety, then that can uh, that, then you can uh, state a question that would somehow um, ask what would be the level of anxiety of the respondents. Next, please. Questions that check significant difference between compared variables. So it's very important that, for example, if you have um, more than two uh, variables, then you consider it to uh, check, uh, for example, whether there is a significant difference um, between um, male and female in terms of their anxiety, then, then you can deploy a question that gives a significant difference. Like, for example, if your study is about anxiety, um among college student and one of your demographic profile is uh sex or gender so there is male and female re um, respondents therefore you want to check if the level of anxiety of male is higher or lower significantly compared to female respondents next questions that check significant correlation between and among variables like for example if you want to check um, um, the significant correlations between um, 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 job satisfaction and organizational commitment, then perhaps you can state there is there a significant correlation between job satisfaction and uh, commitment, whether as satisfaction increases, then commitment increases, or as satisfaction increases, then commitment decreases, okay? That's what's called positive and negative correlations. Next is question that open possible innovations or proposed programs, projects, or intervention. This would probably be the last question that you will consider. Perhaps after all um, this question, you might already come up with a particular intervention program or a proposal or anything that can be that can be um, utilized by the beneficiaries of your study. Like for example, um, what intervention uh, program or proposed intervention program that can uh, that can be um, that, that can be used or developed okay next so example of descriptive type of research question is so let's uh, let's align our research question with the, uh, with the research title okay so our research title is a correlational study between job satisfaction and organizational commitment among employees basis in the development of employee wellness program so if we want to create a research question that is in a descriptive direction, perhaps this is the best um, uh, question or a statement of the problem that we can start. Kindly flash. 
what is the demographic profile of respondents when they will be grouped according to sex, age, marital status, highest educational attainment and employment years. So as you can see, this is very descriptive because we just want to describe the respondent's demographic profile, whether how many percent of males and females is being represented in your um, study or at what age or what is the specific age can we say that there are more respondents and what would be the proportion or the distribution of married respondents, uh, single respondents, or widowed respondents? And in terms of highest educational attainment, how may, uh, what is the percentage of those respondents who are graduate with college degree, master's degree, PhD degree, vocational, or undergraduate? And of course, the employment years, uh, we can, um, we can um, do some range from zero to, one, zero to five years, six to 10 years, or 11 to 15 years, and so on. So that only pure, purely describes the data, okay, by means of giving the frequency or the percentage, okay? Next, using the same research, let's try to conceptualize a research question that assess the research variables, okay? So again, the, the research title is a correlational study between job satisfaction and organizational commitment among employees. So the best research question that has um, a direction to assess research variables would be, what is the level of job satisfaction of respondents when they are grouped according to demographic profile? So therefore, we are, we are now getting a mean score. So at what level do respondents set, um, that, uh, I mean, do respondents are satisfied, satisfied with their job? And also, we can create another question since we, are, we have used um, two variables or two factors that we are measuring. So the next is, what is the level of organizational commitment of respondents? when they are grouped according to demographic profile. So this is represented by mean scores, okay? Especially if you are using, for example, a five-point Likert scale, or if you're using a standard, standardized test that, um, that is being measured quantitatively, for example. So this would be a very good representation of quantitative values. Um, you, may, uh, you may get the mean scores and check their level of um, commitment, and, or commitment and, of course, dissatisfaction, okay? Next, using the same research title, an example of a research question that asks for significant difference. So again, the research title, a correlational study between job satisfaction and organizational commitment among employees. So this would be a best question that asks for significant difference. Is there a significant difference on job satisfaction level of respondents when, res when respondents are grouped according to their demographic profile? So you want to check which is significantly higher in terms of satisfaction? Is it male or female? Is it those um, millennials or non-millennials? Um, is it uh, single or married respondents? So we want to check significant difference in terms of their job satisfaction. And also, since we are using two, um, two variables or two factors being measured here, so you can also say that, please, number five, is there a significant difference in the organizational commitment level of respondents uh, when they are grouped according to their demographic profile okay so i guess it's very important that you need to con you need to consider significant difference because there are a lot of uh, literatures that will that that will say that male male is um highly satisfied in terms of job comparing to female and the like so um it's very important that you have this kind of research question that compares or checks the significant difference because we want to confirm previous studies or we want to check consistencies with previous studies whether the literature or the, the related studies may um, support or not support the results of our study. And that's a very good discussion in our chapter four. Okay, next. Another example of research question that asks for significant correlation. So since this, since this is the research title that we are using, is there a significant correlation between job satisfaction and organizational commitment? So we want now to check whether satisfaction has something to do with commitment. Can we, uh, can, can we say that as job satisfaction increases, organizational commitment increases, or as job satisfaction decreases, organizational commitment decreases, or as satisfaction increases, then commitment uh, decreases and vice versa. 
So it's also important because there are a lot of literatures that might somehow uh, related to our, liter to, to our study that can be a very good reference or we can give also an emphasis on our discussions, okay? Next, an example of research question that asked for a possible innovation or program intervention proposal is that what employee wellness program can be developed to increase satisfaction and organizational commitment of our of employees. So again, it yes, it is uh, it is important to seek the answers to the questions, especially if those questions has research intentions. However, it would be best if you can also create a possibility to resolve or to give uh, solutions to a problem. Like for example, pro giving a proposal um, to develop a module or intervention program or policy reformation because that's the intent of research. The research does not only end in answering questions in a descriptive way or non-descriptive way. The intention of the research, of course, it would be best if you can propose um, solutions in order for this solution to, to be utilized or be used by your beneficiaries, okay? Next, please. So let's go with the research design, okay? What is research design? Of course, a research design is a framework of research methods and techniques utilized by a researcher. This research design guides the researcher on what would be the approach that he or she will be using, the design that is need needed to be used, but take note. Your research design should be aligned with your title and the statement of the problem. Always take note on that. There should be a vertical alignment to what is your title is, to what will be your statement of the problems are. And of course, from this, this guides in the, 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 the deciding point of what would be the research design that you will be using. Okay. Next, please. So what are the key elements of the research design? Of course, you need to check the purpose statement, okay? What would be, what is the intention of your study? Is the intention of your study just describe the variables? Is the intention of your study wants to check a cause and effect relationship? Is the intention of your study wants to check significant correlations or relationship between a variable to the other? Or is the intention of your study wants to check an in-depth analysis through a case study? Or is, your, is the intention of your study is not to do another research, but to collect similar research and do some meta-analysis or do some analysis with related researches and can be a very good point in deriving a particular research opportunity. Okay, next is... Of course, the techniques for the data collection, whether you will be using an interview, a survey, experiments. Next. Of course, the research study settings, you might consider doing it in a laboratory. For example, for experimentation, it would be best that if you will be doing it in a laboratory because you need to control the extraneous variables. Extraneous variables in experimental research is very important in terms of controlling it. Otherwise, um, you might not get the genuine results uh, from your study. It might affect the results of the study if you will not control some extraneous variables. Okay, next. Of course, the timeline. You need to consider the time, whether it would be um, something on um, three months research, a one-year research, or it might consider a longitudinal research. So you need to check um, the the time of the time to accomplish the research. Okay, and also, next please. The analysis, measurement of, and the statistics. Actually, statistics is being defined in your statement of the problem. Like, for example, if you will be uh, using a test for significant difference and you and, and your sub-level for sex as a demographic profile is two, then you may just deploy TITAS for, um, for independent sample, for example, if you want to check which is better, male, and fe male or female in terms of satisfaction or organizational commitment. But if, you're, if your demographic profile is more than two groups, then you may consider the analysis of variance you want to check significant difference between more than uh, two groups, okay? So again, your um, your research design is based on the title that you're working and the statement of the problem, okay? Next slide, please. So what is uh, the difference between quantitative versus qualitative research design, okay? So quantitative is, 
it's a, um, quantitative research aims to give answers to questions like who, what, when, where, and how many. So therefore, when we say quantitative, of course, we are talking about numbers. You might be using a, um, a questionnaire that will ask the respondents to answer it in a quantitative way. Like, for example, if you were given a statement that um, I am happy today, then the respondent may either um, choose one as strongly disagree, then two disagree, three neutral, four agree, five strongly, uh, agree, strongly agree. So it's more on numbers, okay? And statistics, of course, can be used on that. However, for qualitative research design, any flash, please? It aims to give answers to why and how something is happening, okay? So when we say qualitative, of course, we are talking about here, not numbers, okay? We are talking about here um, interviews, okay? We, 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 are, uh, we are talking, uh, we are getting information, not in a quantitative way, but responses in terms of words, okay? Like, for example, if you are doing a case study and you have at least, uh, for example, 10 respondents, then you have a standard questions that you will be um, asking to them. And at the same time, you will be doing the transcriptions and you will be doing the teams in order for it to be, to be analyzed. Okay, next. So what are the common research design used by researchers? Number one is descriptive, of course, as I have mentioned earlier, um, most of the researchers, uh, as a good start, if, if you're not comfortable with using other uh, types of research design, perhaps you can start with research, uh, descriptive type of research. You just simply describe um, the, um, the variables in your study or the demographic profiles in your study, for example. And of course, you might uh, you might also get the, uh, the mean scores while, uh, while you are checking the, for example, the level of satisfaction and organizational commitment as, uh, as an example of a research, okay? Next is experimental, of course. Um, those who are in a medical uh, field profession, most of them are using experimental study, okay? So they want to check the cost and effect uh, re relationship. For example, if I will be manipulating the independent variable, what would be the effect in the dependent variable? And that should be done in a laboratory setting, okay? So it's very important, again, if you will be considered experimental study or if your title start with the effects, please take note that you're already doing an experiment, okay? Because you want to check the effect of something that is being done or being manipulated in the independent variable to your dependent variable, okay? Next is... Correlational type research design. For example, if you want to check whether if when one increases, the other one increases. For example, when when other value decreases, the uh, when when some sorry, the, when 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 one value decreases, the other value decreases, or when one increases, the other one decreases. So you want to check the co the significant correlations, perhaps of a, of a particular uh, variable to the other variable. Another research design is course for qualitative you can use some case study the best approach here the best um interviews like for example you might have you might use um, uh, standard uh, standard questions interviews and perhaps these questions will be asked to your respondents and what you do with informal information you will be recording uh, the entire conversation, and you will be doing the transcriptions. And from the transcriptions, you will cluster similar uh, results and creating teams of teams and like for your analysis. And all others are doing analysis. When you say mass analysis, it, will, it, is, it is not important for you to conduct a uh, new research. What you will be doing is that you will be collecting similar researches with similar variables that are measured. What you will do is to come up with a very good analysis. It comes from those different uh, researches with similar directions, similar variables being measured. Okay. Next slide, please. Next slide. So, all right. So, I'll give you tips on how to help start your research. Uh, 
I'm, I'm pretty much sure that um, you might have some little hesitations in doing this because doing this is not that easy, but of course, with your determination, with your passion, and with your research interest, then it's hard. We are doing a simple research, especially for your students who are doing their thesis, okay? And of course, all the members who are also doing their research, okay? First is, you need to start with the feeling. Okay? In research, it's not that you find a problem, but really think of what a problem is, okay? You need to be really is powerful in research, okay? You need to check the status quo of a particular issue that you want to establish a research interest because at the end of the day, we will be asked, what is the intention of why you want to conduct this research? Those are the questions that you need to answer. What is the research interest? What made you um, make the decide to have the research? Is that something that we need to resolve? Is that, is that something that we need to search again? Those are the questions that you need to consider, okay? And by that, you need to read, okay? Reading is really important, reading really is powerful, okay? Number two is, it is best to do a research that grows as steady in your professional interests, okay? For example, if you are a nursing student, then perhaps the best research interest that you will be doing has something to do with the nursing direction. Psychology as well should focus on psychology because the, our research um, is something phenomenological, something is a personal engagement. Okay? When you do personal engagement, that can align to the profession that you want. Okay? So, doing the research, it would be best if you can consider some professional interest. For example, if you are a teacher, for example, then I guess it would be best if you can consider a research that will somehow develop all your profession as a teacher. It is similar to another profession. Next is Never increase or increase one's anxiety in choosing what type of issue you work. Always focus on what research can be done to address the issue. That will just always remember that, okay? When and handling these issues, students are very interested in the title, okay? But the actual title is not the, the is title development, it's not the first thing to do uh, or to start with. Because you need to do this. check first, you need to read first, okay? You, know, you need to check what is happening in the environment, proper observation can be done, of course, ready. Then from that, you can create already a title that is developmental. When you say title that is developmental, you might create a title, but along the way, there might be little changes on that. Because once you have started your research, you, can, you are now um, getting more information, more empirical data, that somehow um, gives more direction to the research that you have. Okay? Next slide, please. The statement of the problem should be simplified and be aligned with your research title. I'm sitting down with different um, research um, friends. I always remind those um, students and faculty members that if you want to have a very good research, your, your title should align to your statement of the problem. And when, you're, when your uh, statement, statement of the problem is all right, fine, then everything goes well, including your test instrument. Okay? So please remember that there should be a vertical alignment between what your working title is and what are the research problems you have. And along the way, you consider already what's the, what's, what's the correct or the best uh, research design that you will be deploying. Okay? And something worse is no room with your title, okay? And in your statement of the problem. I, I understand that there are some cases that you want you to get impression from others. But you know, the research, uh, the essence of the research is, of course, getting answers and finding answers to a question, okay? That is in your focus. The intention of the research is to make things clear and direct, and not to create flowering words. The more you create flowering words in your title or in your statement of the problem, the more you're confusing to your research to the readers, okay? Always remember that um, maybe your readers are also researchers, and the reason why you're reading is because you want to get research opportunity out of your research. So, as much as possible, be direct, 
make it clear, I know, make it clear, say that the problem, and make also or utilize a research design that is aligned to the intent of your study. From the title exam, so don't be research and say that the problem. And check your title and SOP that can be a good judgment of what research design you will choose. Okay? So I guess that's a simplified discussion on title development, down to research question, and to the uh, research design. I guess more on that, um, we discuss my um, different um, speakers, um, we, um, in God's side. Okay? So that would end my discussion. I hope that every, um, um, in my um, course, in, in the discussions that I have earlier, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to discuss about title development, um, research question, and of course, the research design. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaysen, for that um, informative, very informative um, uh, topic about how to properly or accurately um choose titles and how are we going to do it easily much more easy now because of your topic so um question and answer will be entertained right after this uh, last topic that we have so just uh, for the information of everyone um kindly fill out the um evaluation form that we that we will post on the comments of our youtube section for you to get the certificate the digital certificate that uh, is provided so Again, thank you so much, Dr. Creason, for that um, informative and interesting topic. Okay. okay, so we're now down to the last speaker. So um, our last speaker is a graduate of Master of Education, major in mathematics in the La Salle University, Manila, and is currently writing her dissertation for her PhD. She is an experienced statistician and currently the program chair of the education program in St. Dominic College of Asia. So let us all wait. welcome Professor Maria Eloisa M. Hoson. Thank you, Ms. Kim. Okay, so welcome to our uh, continued support for uh, learning at St. Dominic College of Asia. So today we have uh, some ideas and techniques on how to have uh, analysis of statistical data. Our goal for today is to have uh, this uh, review on concepts about uh, what to choose and how to choose our data and uh, recall some uh, tools on how to have the computation of our uh, statistical data and how to analyze and interpret them properly and correctly. So with that, uh, let us have some recall on research data and what do we mean by this research data. So research data uh, it comes in ma many different formats. Those formats are videos, videos and uh, maybe some diaries. So our research data it is uh, gathered using a wide range of variety of methods or methodologies. So say, for example, uh, we have psychologists uh, who will collect uh, a survey data to better understand the behavior of uh, a human being so that uh, he can properly interpret why such a person act a certain way. Also, we can say that uh, an artist uses, uh, uses data to generate images and sounds. And also, anthropologists use files to document observations about different cultures. Therefore, uh, we do scholarly research across uh, all academic fields and it is increasingly data-driven. That is why we need to realize are we getting correct data for our research. So, 
ang research data, it is any information collected, stored, and processed to produce and validate original research results. So this data might be used to prove or disprove a theory or bolster claims made in research or to further know the knowledge around a specific topic or a specific problem. Now, we know that data may be intangible as it is measured numerically in a given spreadsheet or in a given physical research, such as rats, plants, and insects. So we should be aware if uh, a researcher is uh, someone who studies biology, he might or he he or she might be taking some samples about rats, plants, and insects. So generally, when we uh, Cater or when we talk about data, there will be different formats because we are dealing uh, across all the disciplines. So data may be in a form of document, lab notebooks, field notebooks, or diaries. It may be also taken or uh, in the form of questionnaires, transcript, surveys, code books. May be experimental as what Dr. Quison said, if the research design is experimental, therefore there will be an experimental data. Now, if you are uh, in the field of uh, communication or uh, uh, screen or video editing, you might be having some films, audio, video, tapes, and files. You, you may also have photographs, image files, and sensor readings. Now, you can also test responses as uh, provided a while ago. If, you, uh, if a researcher is an anthropologist, a data will be coming from artifacts, specimens, and physical samples. And lastly, you have uh, data coming from different models, algorithms, just like in mathematics, a script, a content analysis, focus group, recordings, and interview notes. So these are the different data formats that we may consider depending on our discipline and depending on the interest of our study. Now, uh, a while ago, uh, Dr. Quison talked about uh, the different uh, research design. Therefore, a research design may be uh, based on the quantitative or qualitative design. So you need to consider what do we mean by quantitative data. So when we talk about quantitative data, it must quantify the problem or address what is the problem all about, in how many terms the research question would respond to the given research design. Also, your data, when you talk about quantitative, uh, it, uh, it is either uh, counted or compared on a numerical scale. So a data which is quantitative uh, in nature, it is usually gathered using instruments such as questionnaire, uh, rating scale, uh, a thermometer, especially to collect the weather data. And we use basically some statistical software, for example, the SPSS, to uh, analyze the, our quantitative data. On the other hand, we also have qualitative data for the qualitative design research. So if you have a qualitative data, of course, the the characteristic depends on the quality of the variables. So it may also be collected using uh, questionnaires, interview, and observation, taking note that the responses would be in text form or narrative form. So qualitative data may be difficult to precise and measure to analyze measure and analyze. The reason why, if you will be having uh, research design, having a quality data, you should consider a rubric pertaining on how to measure and how to analyze and interpret your qualitative data or the narratives. Also, when you have qualitative data, it may be in a form on how to describe the totality of your uh, data in two words, where it it may you may examine it if you are a researcher in terms of the pattern the meaning of what is being uh, said and 
it may be uh, it may have or may necessarily have to use some coding because every responses is expressed in narrative form or text form so what do we mean by this coding and why do we need to consider coding so if you're a researcher you have to consider coding because because uh, there will be some pieces that you have to interpret and analyze your data. So you use coding for you to categorize the qualitative data and to identify the themes that correspond to the research question and must respond to the questions of your research to perform some qualitative analysis. So this is an example. Uh, by Saldana of 2013, there the uh, reference is noted below, where the raw data is expressed in response as text form. Okay, and there are different variables where the data or the response uh, or the response were provided by the respondent. Those variables were maybe uh, noted as your preliminary. Uh, codes. So uh, the raw data express that the closer I get to retirement age, the faster I want it to happen. I'm not even 55 yet, and I would give anything to retire now. But there is a mortgage to pay off and still a lot more to suck away in saving, savings more before I can even think of it. I keep playing the lottery though in hopes of dreams of early winning those millions, no retirement luck yet. So what are the variables for preliminary codes? So what is noted here, you could have retirement age, financial loss, dreams of retirement, and um, those variables would on what you want to answer in your of them that's the reason why it could be summed up into one variable as a final code as retirement anxiety so as you go about with your research and uh, considering the collection of data you should know the type of research data you are up to so we have what we call observational data experimental data simulation data, derived or compiled data. So do we observational data? So it is known that it is observational data if it can be based or captured based on the observation or behavior or as or of a certain activity. So it may be collected using uh, the methods of human observation, uh, open-ended surveys, use of instruments, use of sensor monitor, and record of information. And these are important for you to have your record or an information that would respond to your state of them. So observational data can be captured in real time. Since it is captured in real time, some researchers who are doing collecting observational data, they are recording uh, the information so that uh, they would capture the end of the collection of data because you know the data, it will be very uh, impossible or difficult for you to recreate if it is lost. Now another is experimental data. So if we have experimental data, as what uh, the previous uh, speaker said, if you are having an experimental design, you will be collecting this through active inter intervention in order for you to produce or measure a change depending on the phenomenon of what you intend to experiment. Uh, it's a research to determine a uh, cause and effect relationship for you to have the projection in terms of your decision or inferences. And lastly, if you are having experimental data, uh, it will be it can be uh, reproducible. 
so you can reproduce your collected data that's so if you're reproducing your data for how many times it will be quite expensive we also have what we call simulation data so simulation data is generated by imitating the operation, the actual operation in the real world process, or it may be a simulation of a given system over time, especially if you are, uh, if you are an IT uh, researcher, you, you want to have it a simulation using a complex model. So a simulation data is used to predict conditions the economic model whether it will there will be a seismic activity so if your research you are using it because you want to determine what would or what uh, could what could happen under a certain condition and lastly Simulator, it tests a model used to uh, often or even more important, more than a data generated from the simulation activity. So uh, at the end of having a simulation activity, you can do it repeatedly and generate it repeatedly until such time you will be able to come derived compiled data. It involves existing data points. It is often from different sources. In order for you to create new data through some sort of transformation because you are you just derive it from a different source. For example, uh, an arithmetic formula or aggression. So the right data or compiled data, it may be a, a combination of what you want to have for a certain research, say, for example, from a certain vicinity of city in a given uh, metro area, in order for you to create and uh, take note of the density of a given population. So you can use this in order for you to uh, uh, collect a uh, given data in uh, in a different resource and you can replace it once it is uh, lost because you can go back to to your resource to your resource though it is time consuming to repeat the process so just a reminder if you will be having different uh, types of data you have to be careful uh, how to save your data because it is important that you will not be wasting your time and energy in your collection of data. Now, the next question is, what is the difference between data and the word statistics? Sometimes, uh, professionally or in the world of research, data and statistics were used interchangeably. But to be specific, when we talk about data, these are individual pieces of facts of information that is recorded and it may be used for a certain purpose for analysis. So it is a raw information from which statistics is created. Therefore, statistics depend on the raw information that you acquire or you collected or gathered. Therefore, when we talk about now statistics, statistics is actually a resort of data collection wherein you intend to analyze, interpret, interpret, and represent the data. So this time, if you have statistics, it would require some computation for you to provide uh, a detailed information for you to understand what is the meaning of that data so that you can present it appropriately in alignment to your statement of the problem and you may have uh, the necessary presentation for a specific problem. Now, uh, again, a while ago, uh, the research de design talks about uh, descriptive uh, and in descriptive research design. Now, what is 
the difference between descriptive statistics and inferential statistics because at the end after the data collection you want to interpret your data based on your research design so you you are using descriptive statistics if you intend to describe as what the previous uh, speaker uh, noted a while ago and you want to uh, note the relationship between variables of a given sample or a given population. So you use a descriptive statistics to the extent uh, in which the observation uh, rounds about the location or central tendency. So the central tendency, those are the, the mean computation, the average computation, the median computation, the middle location, and the uh, mode, the frequency of occurrence of a given uh, frequency. And it also uh, describes about the spread of this extremity of a given dispersion. How are the data or information or the scores are close to one another or quite far away from one another? On the other hand, if you have inferential statistics, you use inferential st uh, statistics for random sample data taken from a population wherein you also would like to describe and uh, make inferences or uh, make projection about a certain uh, result or impact of that given condition. So inferential statistics contain data which are analyzed from a given sample for you to make your inferences for a larger collection in order for you to answer or test your hypothesis. When you test your hypothesis, it means that you want to propose an explanation the a phenomenon or the impact of a certain condition for making your rational decision for, for you to have a wise or correct uh, reality of observed effects. Now, another uh, thing that we have to consider when we talk about data is the data and the statist statistics involved in parametric tests and the non-parametric test, okay? So when we talk about parametric tests, uh, these are the assumed or assumptions wherein the data are noted numerically or quantitatively, wherein it has a normal distribution underlying a given population. Also, it may be noted that some samples are in a, a same variance or homogeneous variance where each, uh, wherein it is taken randomly from a given population and the observation within a group are independent and it can be tested through t-test, analysis of variance or ANOVA, and the repeated measures of ANOVA. Now, you're talking about non-parametric test if your assumptions of normality are not being met. Just unlike in parametric test, it is underlying a normal distribution. So if the normality is not being met, you can have the non-parametric test. Because uh, in a non-parametric test, the uh, distribution may be uh, noted on how you uh, have uh, solutions to erroneous uh, result and you may use such situation as they do not require normality of your assumption. So the non-parametric test may fail to detect a significant difference when compared with a parametric test. So that is usually have less power in terms of the non-parametric test. So we have here uh, types of non-parametric test analysis techniques and the corresponding parametric analysis techniques. In your parametric test, you can have one sample test, t-test, but in non-parametric, you can have sign test, will consult, will consult sign rank test, 
on parametric tests, you can have two sample paired tests. In non-parametric, you can have sign test, Wilcoxon sign rank test, man uh, Whitney Utah uh, test. And Colmo Gozibab is more knob test. And in parametric tests, you can have case sample independent analysis of variance. But in non-parametric tests, you can have Kruskal Wallis test, uh, John Kiri test, uh, Fredman test, and in uh, but while in uh, parametric tests, you can have a two-way ANOVA repeated measure. And also in parametric tests, you can have Pearson correlation, and for non-parametric tests, you can have Spearman rank or spin Spearman row correlation. Now, let us consider some example of computation using an Excel uh, file because you can have your computation using Excel file or uh, some software. Okay, here we have uh, a data which talks about the average for various classroom activities in a mathematics class. So you can have the equal sign in a cell, then click the average from the formula bar, then you may copy, paste, or drag so that you can have the, the sum or the average for a given column, okay? So this, uh, this is the summary of the computation on that uh, various classroom activities implemented in a math class. Uh, it is now in summary form according to the result of the schools and the average and the extent of uh, implementation in terms of the verbal description of the average based on the legend that uh, from 3.28 up to 4, that is very extensive, 2.52 to 3.27, extensive, 1.75 to 2.51, less extensive, and 1 to 1.75 is not at all. Okay, now how do we apply uh, the analysis of our statistics result? Say, for example, we have this question or a problem wherein uh, what is the extent of implementation of the various classroom activities in mathematics as perceived by the student respondents? So based on your summary result of your statistics computation, you can have an analysis and interpretation that it can be seen as an answer that the overall mean average is 2.76 corresponding to an extensive classroom activities implemented in the mathematics class. Now, let us have some more example about uh, a data using SPSS this time. So SPSS is a software that we can use. So with this, we have the variable uh, view where we need to indicate the variables that we want to consider based on the data that we have. So we indicated that there will be no decimal for the grade. We can change the alignment and decide on a scale measure because we will be dealing with the quantitative measurement. Then we can also have, uh, then we can check the data view. Then afterwards, you can uh, key in also the, uh, the other variables change the decimal, uh, indicate the label for that variable, change the alignment, and have, again, the change in terms of the measure. And, uh, again, you can go back to the data view whether uh, the, the, there is change in terms of the characteristics that you indicated with the data or the variable. Then you will do the same process. Okay, then you can check. So as we see, there are uh, decimals, then we change the decimal to zero and that's it. The age doesn't have decimal anymore. Okay, then let us have another example about the computation of mean using the SPSS. 
So this time we want to use descriptive computation about the grade. So we change it to the other options for computation. We consider the mean and we just click OK. And the SPSS software will give us a result about this, the descriptive statistics that we indicated on the uh, characters, characteristics in the SPSS software, okay? So with that, we can have uh, an idea how similar SPSS file be to an Excel file. So as you can see, they have both uh, uh, cells wherein we can copy paste informations or data in uh, the SSS software. This time, uh, instead of having the gender as uh, M or F, uh, we change it to code as one for the male and uh, two for the female for uh, statistics computation purposes. But if your intention is to get the percentage of the, uh, the frequency and percentage of the male respondents and the female respondents, you may have it uh, as is as male and female in your uh, SPSS file but instead of having a numeric computation or measure you, or a scale measure, you can have it nominal scale. Now, this is a variable view as we have seen in the short video of the SPSS. Then uh, we can see the different variables that we indicated uh, for our data. Then at the bottom, you will see the uh, icon, whether you are uh, dealing with a variable view. So since it is the highlighted uh, icon is variable view, it shows uh, the information about the variable view. Then also, uh, the difference between the variable view is that uh, with the data view, it corresponds to the uh, information or specific uh, data that you key in in the data view. So that is on the left side here. Then this one, uh, after uh, uh, having the analysis, the SPSS software will give us the uh, final output based on what we intend to have as computation. So a while ago, we had it uh, having descriptive uh, statistics for the mean computation. So considering the result, we, we take note of the table number, the type, of that table following the uh, APA table format, indicating the legend necessary for interpretation, then go to the uh, uh, problems indicated in your research. Say, for example, in this case, and information, the question is, what is the level of performance in mathematics of student respondents? And you can have your interpretation and analysis based on the table result that in table two, it shows that the level of performance in mathematics of 50 student respondents because of the N variables here with a satisfactory mean grade, satisfactory because uh, it has a mean grade of 8.38 based on the legend. That is 83.38. Looking at the legend, it is uh, under or between 80 to 84.99, which is satisfactory. And the standard deviation of 7.02 here. So that is the dispersion, how close or how, how far away are the data or the statistics wherein you can further uh, interpret it and analyze it this way, indicating that the performance has a minimum grade, which is as low as 70, and a maximum grade of 96 here. Just take note, I indicated here, uh, 
whole number or exact number, in this case, I should have it exact number also without 0 0.00. So with this high or minimum grade and maximum grade, it resulted to a mean grade of 83.38. So with this, we can say that the level of performance resulted to satisfactory performance based on the legend indicated. So it is important when you present your data, you have your table number, uh, title of the table, following the APA format of the table representation, indicate the legend that's it, that is necessary for your interpretation and analysis. Now, let us continue by having a sample on correlation computation using SPSS. So with this, we have the classroom activities uh, for the our data. Then we will analyze using correlate by bar, by bar lead. Okay. Then uh, put the classroom activities to the other side then the grade, then uh, click, okay, then you will have the output or result about the correlation. Now, let us analyze that result. So, we can express it as table 3 based on our uh, example as we proceed with this. Uh, we can have the table number, table 3, and the title would be relationship between the extent of implementation of various activities and the mathematics performance of the respondents. Then we have again the legend for interpretation in terms of the correlational values, the significant level. In this case, it used a 0 0.01 significant level. It means that you are 99% sure about the about uh, your result following a two-tailed analysis. Okay, the possible question in this case would be, is there a significant relationship between the extent of implementation of various classroom activities and mathematics performance of the respondents? And we could have the interpretation and analysis, again, based on the result of the classroom activities pertaining to one because it corresponds to classroom to classroom one then the relationship between classroom and the grade it is negative 0 0.092 it gives you a significant uh, value of 0 0.0527 and again uh, you have to check whether the uh, indicated data is correct that your respondents is 50. Okay, so let's see, we can have an interpretation and an analysis this way. Table three shows the result of the relationship on the, on the extent of implementation of various activities and mathematics performance and the student respondents. So uh, in using IBM SPSS was utilized to obtain the results on the Pearson correlation between uh, the 50 responses of various classroom activities and mathematics performance. The result with critical value, uh, P less than 0 0.01, which is the significant uh, value, uh, implies to accept the null hypothesis, which is represented by uh, H sub O. Then the absolute computed value here we consider the absolute computed value of this is less than, even if you get the absolute value, it will be less than to the critical value provided, which is 0 0.527 measured at 0 0.01 level of significance. <coughs> okay. So what does it mean? It means that the, co the computed Pearson correlation value, which is R, equal to negative 0 0.092, indicates small negative correlation based on the legend provided. So 
there is a correlation but it is small on a on an inverse relation relationship that if one variable of a certain response increases the other variable decreases because of the indication of the negative value now let us proceed with one sample way ANOVA computation using spss so we here we have a sample problem about three groups of stu students uh, each were a group subjected to the three types of uh, teaching method where the grades of the students are taken at the end of the semester enumerated accordingly using this uh, table so in the table we can see a column per student one to six then the method use uh, method a method b method c and the corresponding grades that is uh, being uh, indicated so uh, what we can have using the excel file is that for us to compute one way uh, anoba is to have the grades using the method a Combining it with the grades using method B, then combine again with the grades using method C, then uh, afterwards we will cluster the grades into three groups since we have three methods indicating that each group must contain uh, six clustering. So, I know, six values in three clustering. So, we have here three, uh, six values of one for the first cluster. Then we have uh, two values for, uh, uh, six values for twos and six values for threes. Then we will copy that into our... Uh, SPSS format or software. Then after copying, we can have we can check the variable view if we have indicated the uh, correct variables. Then we can have compare uh, compare means computation for one way ANOVA for the dependent variable which is the score and the factor which is the sample. So with that, the, your SS, SPSS software will provide you uh, an output for the analysis of variance or ANOVA. So this is the problem that is provided in the uh, video a while ago. Then we have the result. Again, we have the table number, the title of the table, and the values uh, copied from the result of the SPSS. Then the possible question for this problem is that, is there a significant difference on the performance of the students in relation to the three types of teaching methods? And we can have our interpretation or analysis for table four that it shows the result on one-way analysis of variance or ANOVA computation using IBM SPSS. That the result with critical value of uh, 0 0.05 implies to reject the null hypothesis that it means the absolute computed value 13.121, which is here, is actually greater than the critical value provided 0 0.001 measured at 0 0.05 level of significance, meaning you are 95% sure that you are correct in terms of your computation. Hence, you can have a conclusion based on the analysis that it, it the results reveal that there is significant difference in the performance of the students in relation to the three types of teaching methods okay uh, i think this is my last slide and uh, 
I would like to thank everyone uh, for listening. And I hope I was able to share some uh, bits of uh, information or techniques on how to go about with your uh, collection of data, uh, having your uh, presentation of data, and uh, having the correct description, interpretation, and analysis in alignment to the statement of your problem. So, Again, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, um, Professor Hossa, for that very informative topic about statistics in research. So now we're going to... Um, go to the last part of our um, research um, seminar, which is the question and answer. So let's just look into the um, our live um, YouTube comments to see if we have any questions for our panel um, speakers. Okay, so um, as we are waiting for Dr. Liwan, and so just a few reminders to get your digital certificates for the three topics that we have, and you fill out the um, evaluation link um, on the comment section of our YouTube live, and make sure that you have in you have entered your SDCA Gmail account. So here we have Dr. Liwanag. Dr. Liwanag, um, there's one question for you. Um, what to do to avoid plagiarism? Okay, so as I have said a while ago in my webinar, uh, it is in, it is important you have to to follow almost all the uh, suggestions there. You no, know? first is uh, once you you uh, hold on to a reference book, make sure that you already uh, take note of the author the title of the book so you you have to to write them now always take notes of the books that you are reading if you are uh have a, a several uh, res, uh resources okay that is one thing no? very important and and then meron pa pong question Okay, so thank you so much for answering that question, Dr. Liwanag. So um, I guess, um, so I'm just going to browse through the comments to see if we have any more questions for our other panel members. Um, so I have a question for Dr. Quison. So Dr. Quison, um, this question is, um, if I am doing a research but I'm finding it hard to start, what should I do? All right. I, I guess that's the first thing that you need to do is to read, okay? Um, you don't need to acknowledge that you need to right away do a title, okay? What you need to do is try to read some current events, some uh, thing, I mean, things that is happening now, uh, especially right now that we are facing this pandemic or crisis. So it's very important that our observation plays an important role in the development of our title or, or on our research titles, okay? 
we might have titles in, the, in our mind, but we need to take note the research interest, or we need to ask why there is a need for us to conduct that research. And perhaps if you have difficulty um, drafting your title, or it took you, it might took you more time to draft your title, read first. Try to be guided with what uh, what are the things that is being uh, that are uh, the things that are that is happening right now. And at the same time, by reading, you can start uh, slowly developing your title. I guess that's the best uh, tip that I can give to that student who asked that question. You need to read for us, okay? Parang ako po ata yung nagtanong ng question. Okay, so we have last question for the uh, for for prof Professor Hoson. So in terms of statistics, for how will we get to choose the appropriate statistics for a specific um, type of research? I will pick up the discussion of uh, Dr. Chris on a while ago. He, he talks about uh, how to formulate the title since the title must be aligned to the research design as well as, uh, as, well as the formulation of the research problem. So if everything is aligned accordingly, therefore, with that, that will be your basis on how to go about with your statistics because that will be your guideline in terms of decision making because everything must be in alignment from the variables of the title, the formulated uh, problems, then the computations necessarily included in chapter three uh, based on the research design. So. Uh, everything must be in alignment, lahat yun, kapit-kapit kasi talaga. Uh, yun yung tinitignan natin sa pag nag-check tayo ng, stat ng st statistical results. Yun bang uh, results nila, na-collect nila, does it answer the SOP? Is it aligned to what uh, they have expressed in, in their methodology in terms of, of the research design? Because uh, even if they if they have a very uh, many information collected data, but if it doesn't respond to the problem, to the research design, that there is no alignment or there is this alignment, uh, that will not be uh, correct statistical representation, and there will be no correct statistical analysis and interpretation. So thank you so much for that um, comprehensive answer, Professor Hoso. So I have one more for um, Dr. Luanag. So Dr. Luanag, the question is, um, what is the importance of informed consent in research? Of course, no. Okay, all research have to uh, uh, inform no, the participants that they are going to uh, participate in research okay it is very important because uh, the, you are the of, of course they are the, you are the they are the participants and they have to know what are the the questions or what are the things they have to go through with your research so uh, for this uh, all researchers are required no to have a letter or form of a uh, letter form uh, letter of consent to all the participants which you are going to uh, have validated, you no, know, inform your, you have uh, let your advisor check your inform so that uh, the completeness of the form of consent is, uh, 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 what do you call this, satisfied, you no, know? and then uh, you have to also ask permission, you no, know, to the school or the organization where you are, uh, have to distribute the uh, informed consent. So with the informed consent, you have other uh, documents that go with it. No, the per letter of permission. Okay, I think there are three that I made for the school uh, because I done qualitative. So all of these are interviews in and observation. So in preparing for the documents for the ethics, or uh, this is a uh, of course this is a general rule, no? That you really have these documents in order for you to collect data. 
okay. Thank you for the Thank question. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Liwana. I have one more for Professor Hosa. So and this is a very good question. So I find statistics very hard. I think we can all relate to that. We find math very hard. So how will I start appreciating statistics since it's very important in research? Okay, but, um, I'm gonna repeat the question. So I find statistics very hard. How will I start appreciating statistics since it's very important in research? Should I repeat the question, ma'am? Ma'am Hoson? Okay, so um, I'm just going to type in the question. How do I start appreciating statistics since it is important in research? Okay, uh, let me answer this uh, based on what we have, okay? Uh, women nowadays are very much uh, into the statistics of their body. So that's a reality that uh, we consider some parts of our body import is important the measurements, and everything related to that. So if you appreciate yourself as a person, definitely there's number in relation to what we have as a person. So appreciating the humanity has a representation in numbers. So everything that we have as we put them together can be a gathered data or gathered information. Now, once we want to have uh, a resulting or a related problem, or we are motivated to pursue an answer to a related problem to that, then we will proceed to some computation. And we will be seeking or be motivated to do more and to do our research. Once we do our research already, then we must respond that we need to answer our inquiries in mind. Then after that, we will have the data, we will have the statistics, and everything will follow since the motivation is there. You will be motivated to come up and have an accurate and com uh, real computation for you to have answers to your inquiry. Everything that is around us, related to us, talks about numbers. Therefore, there must be appreciation of numbers wherein you can have computation in relation to statistics. So, Malaki yan, sakop niya. Ma-appreciate mo sarili mo, ma-appreciate mo ng mag-compute. As long as uh, maging masaya ka habang nagko-compute, motivated ka habang nagko-compute, yun yun eh. Nandun yung appreciation mo.
much for that um, answer, Professor Hoso. So I guess statistics is really a part of our daily life. So we have a few more questions um, from our YouTube live. So um, this is for um, Dr. Liwana. So Mr. Voltaire Carrera would like to know if it's considered plagiarism Cuba if I were just to paraphrase and cite it. As I have discussed a while ago in one of my slides, you know, paraphrasing, if you are not aware, can be uh, considered as plagiarism. Okay, so you must be aware that if you paraphrase, you don't go beyond the idea of the real author. No, hindi ka lalabas doon sa sinasabi ng author. But you can use other terms and then you can uh, you can have the restate no the statement of the author in such a way that the thought is still there okay and then you can cite it also is as as given in one of my the slides in my example yes okay thank you thank you so much dr liwana so next question would be for dr quizon so jana would like to know if how will um how to identify a good and bad research question Okay, so of course, in relation to ethics, I guess we need to consider also ethics in designing our research title, okay? The intention of the, um, uh, the research title is for us to seek answers, not to malign a particular entity, not to degrade someone's, um, for, for example, dignity of an organization. So in design or creating a research title, always remember that there's also ethics behind in, in, develop, in developing a research title, okay? So for example, if you were creating a title and if I will, if I will be a reader, that would, that would be your title would malign a particular entity or a particular organization. And perhaps that's no longer a concept of research. That's already going beyond what is being expected for you as a researcher. So take note again that the, insert, the intention of the research is to search answers for questions, not to malign a particular entity or particular uh, organization, okay? And I guess we need also to put some limitations in our research title so as to make a meaningful uh, research um, engagement, okay? So I guess our title development has something to do also with the ethics that we discussed earlier by, by Dr. Luanal, okay? Um, um, another thing is that um, in terms of plagiarism, you cannot use the same type of title being used by previous researchers who are already being published, or should we say it's not published for ethical reason. That's the reason why if you will be considering a title, make sure that your title is not the same title that they are that the previous work, um, I mean researchers have been done already. So make sure that there is a distinction, there is a difference, although they are the, although your uh, researcher researchers are measuring the same dimensions or variables. But take note that you should your research title should be distinctive or should be different from other published research. Okay, just to um, get uh, or get away from that plagiarism thing. Okay, and that's the that's the best thing that Dr. Yuhana has already explained earlier. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Quison, for that comprehensive answer. So we have one more. Um, we have four more questions. So um, the third one would be. Um, from Adri Heronimo. So, what's uh, this is for um, any one of you? Po. Um, what are the strategies that can be done if there is limited to no resources for the RRL? Professor Hudson? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I think. I can I answer? Okay, so I am not buying limited resources for RRL, no? And uh, there are so many, many related literatures if you are just going to read, read researchers. So the key is read, no? Read researchers. And it depends upon your title, no? Yeah, so sabi nga ni Dr. Quison, no, if your title is uh, really good, there are really others. But of course, uh, research is, is eyeing for something that is novel. No, that is novel. So, may mga times, but if you are really patient enough, no, if you are really patient enough, there are really no limitations, I think, to related literature. Yeah, you just have to. Siguro, uh, hindi naman yung limit to limit na as in uh, very few, no? Pero there are. There are. 
Okay. And also to actually to add also Dr. Diwanag, since you are currently uh, at this time of pandemic or crisis, when we will be doing a research, one of the abilities that we need to consider is our search ability online. But take note that not everything online is um, indeed true or should we say in fact. Um, we need to check first the validity of the resources that we are getting online. That's the reason why it would be best that you can get some journals that is published online. I guess journals is journal journals are the best uh, sources that we can get in terms of its authenticity because those are published research. In order for us to have a meaningful references, I understand that we may have difficulty at this time of crisis or pandemic in getting resources outside, specifically, for example, in a repository or library. But we need to take note that in online uh, searching, in terms of our ability to search, then we can uh, get some resources online. But make sure, check the authenticity of the documents that you are downloading. Or if, if, if in any case, again, talking about what, what Dr. Lee Wanag said earlier, the concept of proper citation in order for you not to um, not to plagiarize a particular word, I, I mean works, you need to properly cite where did you get, who is the author, and of course, um, what what would be the reference of the resources that you have get which is related to the researches that you are working okay thank you professor Hawson, do you have any um something to add for, for the question Uh, maybe what I can say to that is uh, uh, we have we have limited uh, resources if we we are not specific with the variables that we have in our research. So we must clearly identify specific variables based on the title, based on the SOP. So that we we can have uh, or we can utilize available resources. So uh, usually, what I suggest is it could be based on journals, theses, news articles. Uh, uh, we could have the uploaded uh, relevant files as long as it is updated. But thinking always that the bar those uh resources must be in alignment to what we need sometimes uh, there's difficulty and we feel that we are limited because we do not know what we want to find yung nalilito ano ba yung hinahanap ko talaga kaya feeling mo wala hindi mo uh, parang kulang kasi uh hindi hindi maayos yung identification ng variables. That's the reason why I always tell the students, if you will have your uh, review of related literature, make it a point that you can have, or you have uh, thematic representations of the variables in your title. So if it will be according to the theme, then you will see that there will be the uh, alignment of uh, everything and you can easily capture what you need. Yun yung isang technique na pwedeng gawin. So thank you so much to our panel members. So um, I guess we can accommodate two more questions. So we have one from our chief librarian, um, Ms. Laila Ariate. Um, I guess this is for Dr. Liwana. So um, the question is, for the application of research ethics, how are we going to conduct our collections of data using phone interview? How is the validation? Okay, so for the telephone interview, I have a limited idea, no? Because for one, oh, it is, uh, of course, the telephone interview is becoming uh, popular now, especially this pandemic, no? But, but then, this is a, a method that is uh, has a question, questionable, because sometimes, of course, di ba yung data privacy of the telephone, we don't know if, or what is behind the uh, Din sa telephone interview, no? So, uh, I don't have much idea about, because for me, I prepare a, a, a 
person to person or your personal interview but there are advantages of course of the telephone interview because it is flexible no and then uh, the researcher can also uh, collect a uh, clear uh, I, I mean yung mga research in manage uh, what do you call this uh, flexible and assess uh, some unavailable no traditional methods no that uh, is especially now it's pandemic but uh, that's the only one i know limited lang yung alam ko for the telephone interview maybe doc quizon can help me answer it <laughs> <laughs> and Ma'am Hoson. <laughs> okay, sure, no, not a problem. Okay, um, again, we are in a pandemic or crisis, and one of the, um, if, for example, if you are doing a qualitative research, and one of the strategy that we are deploying is interview, and it's really hard for us to have physical or face-to-face -face interview, then we decided to conduct phone interview. Always remember that, of course, in a qualitative, qualitative study, we need to do the transcriptions. But prior to the transcription, you need to ask, again, inform consent and permission from that person that this will be recorded. That's the first thing that you need to do. The only time that you will record the conversation is when the person who, who is being asked by that question agrees to be recorded. Then that's the time that you will record. At least you have, um, you have followed a protocol on how to do a, an interview via phone because if you will be recording it without permission and the person will um of course will ask why you're recording when where in fact you're not giving um you're not you're, you're not asking my consent to be recorded then therefore you already violated some research ethics in that particular instance so it's very important that for example if you will be calling a person and that person is being identified as one of your respondents with informed consent and permission that this to be recorded, then that's the time that you can record the conversation. Otherwise, you may not consider the recording or not consider anymore that person to be part of your respondents. Because again, qualitative needs, needs to have a transcription. But in the absence of a permission, in the absence of informed consent, then you cannot proceed with the interview. Then just look for another individual so who is accommodating and willing willing uh, to be recorded in terms of the uh, interview being done via phone. I, ho I hope that I have enlightened something. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for helping me answer. <laughs> You're welcome, <laughs> Dr. Liwan. <laughs> okay. Skim? Okay, so um, we have um, two more follow-up <laughs> questions. In terms of what, <laughs> and dami po nagtatanong sa YouTube um, channel natin. So very interested sila with the topic. So um, the uh, second to the last question is, is it essential to validate my own survey questionnaire by a professional? Of course. <laughs> Of course. Of course. Okay, of course. It is very important. It's 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 an part. It's a natural part, no? Or it's an uh, talagang kumbaga part talaga siya. Hindi siya pwedeng tanggalin sa isang research. The validation. Oh, otherwise you cannot use it. Exactly. Hindi siya pwede. <laughs> Hindi siya pwedeng gamitin. Uh -oh. Okay. Maybe we can ask our statistician, Dr. Hoson. Oh, yes, Dr. Hoson. <laughs> the importance of uh, in, in establishing a very good reliability score. <laughs> Hello, ma'am. Naglalag ata si ma'am. Uh -huh. Paulet, ma'am Kim. Oo, oh, naglalag. Uh, Yung the question. The question po, Prof. Hoson. Can you repeat, ma'am uh, um, Kim? Is it necessary po to validate the questionnaire by a professional? By, by a professional. professional. By a professional. Is it necessary to validate a questionnaire by a Professional. professional or an expert but of course <laughs> uh, based on <laughs> yes, uh, yes. our based on our institutional yeah. protocol even uh, ever since the world began we do not allow mm -hmm. any collection of data if a questionnaire or instrument is not validated otherwise if a student or a researcher would proceed to data collection without validating the questionnaire 
the uh, the data collected will be invalid because of the word valid okay so validity means the accuracy the correctness the alignment of the questions indicated in the instrument if there is no again paulit ulit sinasabi if there is no align for the researcher to collect the correct data at the end of the day the collected data will be wasted why because the researcher does not uh, solicit uh, uh, validation from a professional wherein the professional would share the expertise ever evaluating the instruments so that at the end of the day after the data collection there will be correct analysis interpretation and everything the statement of the problem will be answered because the instrument is properly and professionally validated otherwise sayang kung itutuloy niya exactly yes that's why if they are collecting data, I, I see students uh, several times if they're, I am asking the uh, validate, validation form. Kasi di ba may form po yan, di ba, na it is validated, is signature. And take note, di ba, there are experts, consider, uh, there are expert considered on your field, no? Kanya-kanyang field yan. So, hindi pwedeng... Uh, even it is he is or MA or PhD. No, uh, there is a, a specific discipline to validate your uh, instrument. Yes, and in relation also to their answers, the reason why we're getting samples from the population because we want to make the sample as an inference in the population. But if you have your test instrument that is not valid nor reliable, therefore you cannot return back your samples to the population and describe the population that this is the characteristics now of, of the population. Always remember that if you want to have a good inference of your sample describing a population, you should start with a, with a, a valid and reliable test instrument. And just to share with you, um, yes, it should be validated by professional, but always remember, in relation to the answer of Dr. Liwanag, you should get subject matter experts who can yes. validate your mm -hmm. test instrument. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you might get a professional who is professional by essence, but not a subject matter expert in your expert. paper. Mm -hmm. So, um, therefore, um, we need to uh, we need to validate the test instrument. There are researches, actually, I've seen that the, that the uh, test instrument is not valid. Well, technically, you can still discuss, but you cannot return the discussion to your population because you cannot say that the that the population is this. Why? Because you, you have you have deployed an invalid and not reliable test instrument. And someone asked me, what is the um, Cronbach's alpha that is acceptable in a social science research? Um, I normally say it's 0.7, but it, if it can be 0.8 and above, why, why not? Okay, Because there is, again, a margin of error uh, within. So again, it's really important to validate your test instrument. And always remember, not all professionals can validate your test instrument. Check subject matter experts to validate your test instrument. Okay, Thank you. Okay, so I guess you have all um, the panel, the speakers have already answered all of the questions um, on our YouTube and our St. Dominic College of Asia page. So with that, um, I will give this um, opportunity for our Dean, for the Dean of the School of Arts, Sciences and Education, Dr. Philip Cordova Quisa, to close uh, to formally close this um, webinar. All right, thank you, Ms. Kim. On behalf of St. Dominic College of Asia, headed by our president, Dr. Gregorio Andaman Jr., and of course, our dynamic vice president for research, extension, and linkages, Dr. Neil Dabalsikas, in collaboration with our vice president for academic affairs, Dr. Mary Nelly Tiroa, we would like to thank your time, effort, and of course, your um, compassion with us in terms of research. Thank you for attending. Thank you for viewing this wonderful speaker. I highly sa uh, salute uh, Professor Hosan and Dr. Liwanag and the rest thank of the you. research team. And of course, thank um, you, Dean. Thank you very much.
for moderating this. Thank you, Hope you have um, um, uh, get some at least um, if it's not new, but additional idea on what really research is, what statistics, and what in, what is the importance of um, research ethics in the conduct of research. And I hope that um, in the succeeding um, webinars, we can um, add you more knowledge about how you can dwell with research in such a way that you're following some protocols, procedures, and proper guidelines aligning to the guidelines of our institution. Again, thank you. Please keep safe and please keep yourself uh, free from COVID. Okay, thank you guys and have a wonderful morning. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Dean. God bless. Thank you, Prof. Thank, Thank you, Miss Team. Thank you, SDCA community. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye. Okay. So, so that formally ends our yeah. webinar for today about research. So we will see you guys again on our next Gabini Connect to be posted on our SDCA page. So follow, like, and subscribe on our social media channels for you to get updated. So thank you so much and have a nice day.